President Trump's travel ban has led to more than a week of legal confusion and turmoil, but its effect is also being felt in countries not even included in the ban. David Miliband is the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee and a former Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs for the United Kingdom, and he joins me now. Thanks so much for being with us. Great we really to be with appreciate you. it. All right, so first I want to ask you about this travel ban. How has it affected the work that you're doing right now? Well, most important, it's affected hundreds of people who are due to come to the United States as refugees who've been vetted uh, to ensure that they're not a threat to the country. They're obviously not able to, weren't able to come until the court order came in to disallow President Trump's uh, executive order. Right. So the first impact is here at home where we resettle refugees in 29 U.S. cities. However, the International Rescue Committee is also an international humanitarian aid agency. We're working in Somalia, Syria, the countries that are banned, but also in the neighboring states. And I have to report that the world has noticed this. And the fears that have been expressed by people like the former director of the CIA, that this is a propaganda gift to those who would do harm to America, I'm afraid we can bear that out. We know that people are asking themselves the question, is America really shutting its doors on me? Does that mean that they actually don't want Muslims in their country? And that's obviously very serious. You wrote in the New York Times, uh, historically, the United States has welcomed the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, and this has helped cement America's leadership of the international order. But there are a lot of Americans right now, millions of Americans who support President Trump, who say, look, we've been doing this for quite a long time right now. There are serious security concerns. The president has voiced them. Um, why does this continue to be the way that they would term it America's problem? Well, the only good thing about this controversy is that I can come on shows like this and explain that Americans can have their security and have their values at the same time. It's harder to get to America as a refugee than any other route. It takes a minimum of 12 months of vetting. It's actually up to three years, up to 36 months. 12 to 15 government agencies do interviews, biometric testing, to make sure that the people who are trying to come here as refugees, who are saying that they've been bombed out of their houses in Aleppo, who are saying that they've been victimized in Afghanistan, to make sure that those people are who they say they are. And that's why the refugee resettlement system, one of the reasons it's been a success in this country, people are properly vetted. That when they come, they really are breathing their first breaths of freedom and they know how valuable it is, and they become successful, productive, patriotic Americans. All right, let's switch focus now and talk a little bit about Europe, uh, specifically the United Kingdom. The Speaker of Britain's House of Commons um, has said on Monday that President Trump should not be allowed to address Parliament. Historically, that's been done when the United States President visits um, the UK. Um, he's opposed to the President's visit because he says the President has sexist and racist views. Um, how do you think this is going to play out, and do you think that this ban has sort of enabled or allowed people to think that what the, he is saying is actually accurate? Well, there's no doubt that the most direct reputational harm to the U.S. from the executive order is across the Middle East and elsewhere, where people are whispering in the ears of Muslims, look, Ameri we told you America was never going to have your back. There it is. But there's a second reputational harm, and that's amongst the allies. Allies who are saying, look, in Europe, a million refugees arrived in 2015, mainly because there wasn't proper provision for them in Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey, countries that have got most refugees. And that reputational uh, ha harm comes about because Europeans are saying, hang on, America's not going to bear its share of the load. Right. And the truth is that Western countries, countries like the UK, countries like the US, are, are taking relatively few refugees. A country like Lebanon has over a million. A country like Turkey, over two million. The debate here in the U.S. is should there be 100,000 or 50,000? You can see the numbers are much lower. And so Europeans are also asking what's happening to America's leadership of the global institutional order. And I think that's a secondary damage that's worth thinking about. It's been reported that, uh, that for jihadist groups, whether it's al-Qaeda, whether it's ISIS, Boko Haram, that uh, the travel ban is sort of a gift to them. A recruiting, uh, a recruiting, a recruiting yes. gift. Do you agree? Yes. I mean, basically, I do for two reasons. One, our own experience. But also, there are people, former director of the CIA, Michael Hayden, um, very hard-headed man, 30 years in the CIA, he wrote in the Washington Post, this makes our job of international intelligence more difficult. In my former job uh, as the Foreign Secretary of the UK, I was responsible for the UK Foreign Intelligence Service, MI6. And we know that trust and value and respect and honor for different religions and different nationalities are a very important part of the tradecraft. And that is a very worrying to hear someone like Michael Hayden reporting uh, that. So I think it is a propaganda gift. And it's one that sits ill with the truth that three and a half thousand Muslims working in the American military today. Right. 
Uh, 800,000 refugees come to America since 9-11. None of them have committed an act of terrorism on American soil. Specifically so that, those that have been named in that ban. Exactly. Uh, those countries that the president's administration has named as those that they want to prevent people exactly. from coming I mean, to. Look, the, the real feeling is sadness, I think. There's anger, but there's also sadness. And the sadness is that America has a refugee resettlement system it can be proud of. Sure, a new administration can review that system. That's perfectly reasonable. But they can review it without cancelling the existing system. Successive Homeland Security Secretaries, Bush... Obama secretaries have said, you've got a good system. If the new administration wants to review it, the way out of this legal morass, humanitarian chaos, reputational damage, is to say, let's keep the existing system, but let's do the 90-day review, the 120-day review. That would be good, sensible policy making. Let me switch gears just a little and get your take on uh, what's been happening across Europe right now. We've seen a significant number of far right wing political groups gaining traction. The National Front in France, uh, Alternative for Germany, obviously in Germany, uh, the Party for Freedom in the Netherlands. Is that troublesome to you? Yes, it is very troublesome. Look, it says that center right and center left, whatever their differences, are not able to command the confidence of their own populations who are turning to the extremes, in this case the extreme right. And obviously that's very worrying, especially given the echoes of European history. I would say the centre ground in European politics on the right and left still is vibrant, it still is strong. The most popular politicians in Germany, you mentioned that, are actually the centre right and centre left politicians, not the extremist uh, politicians. But of course it's worrying. Look, uh, National Front, uh, Mrs. Le Pen has 30% in the first round of the polls in France, you've got to be worried that people aren't persuaded by the policy solutions that are being offered by the centre-right, centre-left candidates. And I think it's a real warning that if policy answers don't meet people's needs, then they will turn to extremes. Maybe you're not used to that in American politics because you've just got two main parties. In European politics, it's common yeah, to have five or yeah, six parties, right. even in the UK, the five or six main parties now. And, and I think that's a, what a lot of people are sort of looking at right now. They're sort of saying, look, uh, we see what's happening in Europe. I think people who support Marine Le Pen or others um, of these far-right political groups would say that the current status quo, which is what President Trump campaigned on, the drain the swamp idea, um, is not working for people, not just in this country. Well, but but those... refugees aren't the swamp. I mean, that's my uh, point. And the European situation is very difficult because by the virtue of geography, there are parts of the European Union that are in the Middle East. I mean, right. Cyprus is... That's in right. the Middle East, to all intents and purposes. It's six kilometers from the Turkish coastline to Greece, which is in the European Union. So by the blessings of geography, America is able to have its cake and eat it. America can do the right thing by the refugees, a relatively small number of whom are allowed into this country, and take care of its own security, take care of its own problems. Uh, we've got to wrap this up because it's such an interesting discussion, but I, I just have two final questions for you. Um, have you spoken to Theresa May, the Prime Minister, about your concerns? Because there are a lot of people in the UK who were perhaps not happy with her visit here, that she didn't press herself, uh, President Trump, on this ban. I, I haven't been able to actually know. I mean, I now live and work, obviously, in the US. Sure. The International Rescue Committee is a, a US um, international humanitarian organization. I haven't spoken to her about it. She may have noticed some of the things that I right. said. I always <laughs> congratulate the UK on their international humanitarian aid, which is a really good part of them. They don't do well on refugee resettlement. 4,000 Syrians a year is very low, although I read today they're no longer going to be taking unaccompanied children. And that, if that's true, that's a very bad step backwards. Final question. Um, the Trump administration is debating whether or not to designate the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization. If the president does move forward with that, um, how could that impact U.S. relations with the Middle East, specifically in Egypt? Well, I think that in among the governors, among the government in Egypt, that would be very popular, probably. Yeah. Because they've probably been pressing for it. Right. In other parts of the Middle East, including in Turkey, it would be unpopular. I mean, you've got very divided politics now across the Middle East. It's very important to tread with extreme care. In Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood run for, ran for election in 2012. And they, put, they put the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood in, in prison. Subsequently, he overreached his powers. He, he, he was then uh, put in uh, jail. The, the test that we always used when I was in government was about whether or not groups were using terrorist means to advance their goals. And it's the crossing of the boundary from politics into violence that is the ultimate test of whether an organization should be classified as a terrorist organization or a political organization. So if uh, the leadership in Egypt, General al-Sisi, because he is against the Muslim Brotherhood, if, he, if President Trump sides with that, with his interpretation... Yeah. Well, I think the truth is that 
there are millions of Egyptians who will support, who do support the uh, Muslim brother and continue to do so. There are also many across the region. As I say, I think the test is going to be whether or not he, if they've got new evidence that, uh, of, of violence, that obviously is relevant. But I, I would make the point that the politics of the Middle East are explosive at the moment. All of the issues that are being debated by the new administration, you need to see the links between them. And you're seeing that in the Syria conflict where we want to support Russia, Russia supports Assad, oh dear, Iran also supports right. Assad. It's all connected. Yeah. And I think it's important to join the dots, not just to see the separate ones. David Miliband, thank you so much thank for stopping you so by. Much. Fascinating discussion. We really appreciate it. Thanks.